All right, so there's still people joining, um, but I think we might get started uh, just so that we can get, get the evening underway. Um, so before, before we start, uh, we wanted to just give a quick introduction um, from ourselves as the organizers of this event, just to give a bit of background. Um, so myself and uh, my colleague Joanna will just um, say a few words. Uh, so my name is Emily Glazer. Um, and I'm one of the organizers of paper of this event. Um, we're also for this event doing visual descriptions for people um, for whom that might be useful um, for accessibility reasons. So I'm a white woman with um, short curly brown hair um, and a gray, no, sorry, brown top. Um, and um, firstly, we just wanna say thank you so, so much um, for joining us. We're really overwhelmed with um, with the numbers of people um, and the response that we've had to this seminar, we had, um, I think, over 400 people sign up. And at the moment, um, almost 300 people on uh, this Zoom, which is quite incredible. Um, and I expect that more people might join soon as we come along. So um, so thank you so much for joining with us. Um, and we're really excited to have um, uh, the conversation today with Linda, uh, with Toyin, um, with Jordi and um, with Danetta. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, so as background, um, this is a project that was started by um, a few PhD researchers um, in the Department of Anthropology at University College London um, in the UK. Uh, so it's myself and Joanna who will speak in a little bit um, and Chloe Dominique. Um, Alice Riddell uh, and Victoria Tecker, who are behind the scenes of this Zoom right now, and maybe waving. <laughs> um, and so uh, we gathered um, together based on a few sort of strands that had been brewing for quite a while. Um, so one of them was just based on our personal and collective experiences of um, practicing and learning ethnographic research methods and um, ethics in the department um, at UCL where over the years of our PhDs and also for some of us um, undergraduate and master's degrees, there were conversations in corridors and in pubs um, just about some of the themes that we thought would be really worthwhile surfacing during this event series. Um, and then over the past year at UCL, there has been the formation of the Anti-Racism Committee or the ARC, um, which was initiated to really directly tackle in a structural way um, some of these issues um, or all of these issues within within the department. Um, and so we saw this as an opportunity for change to actually start to happen. Um, and um, we saw a space where there could be um, sort of movement for that um, and where we would have an opportunity to maybe um, contribute to that effort through a focus um, on research methods um, and how they're taught. So um, the four or five of us came, came together um, in the autumn to start to develop a few ideas. Um, and in conversation with the ARC, uh, we developed the, the framework for this project. Um, and so uh, what our intention is, is to host this series of um, four seminars. This is the first one, um, and it will be followed by two workshops with PhD students. Um, which will not just be a kind of open space for dialogue, which is what we wanted to be able to foster here, um, but also very much an opportunity to um, translate all of the discussions that will be surfacing here into change for pedagogy within the department. So after these events, we'll be working really closely um, with the ARC to sort of translate um, recommendations that will emerge from the workshops um, into a change in the um, the academic uh, programming for pedagogy within the department. Um, so my colleague Joanna will take over from here, um, but thank you so much for joining and we're really, really excited to have everyone here this evening. Welcome for me too. Um, I'm Joanna, I'm Mediterranean white with brown hair wearing yellow purple. And I have to admit that when I first got engaged in the paper project, I was a little skeptical and unsure of if anti-racism would be the flair of the month or a sustained effort to shift our academic paradigm. However, over the past months, we have observed the work taking place in the department towards that direction, which has been inspiring. And ultimately, it is up to us how far we want to take it. 
So we're working on this project very much not as experts, but as possession subjectivities with individual experiences, learning and unlearning through this process. And we kind of welcome that, that um, way of engaging in the seminars as well. Um, in the following seminars, we will look at researcher participant relationships, the role of witnessing and participant observation and the politics of academic representation. For this first one, though, we thought we should start by turning our gaze inward to our academic institutions. So tonight we will be talking about the present need to decolonize methodologies, reflect on how colonial mentalities are still manifested in academic institutions and how we can address them. We have also invited UCL outsourced workers in tonight's conversation. Um, the fact that the majority of people on UCL uh, zero, zero hours slash zero rights contracts at the moment come from former colonies, British or other, ties for us the conversation on the very present legacy of colonialism in spaces of academic production. So we think that if we're to collectively start thinking of consciously detaching anthropology's role from the colonial legacy, we also feel that these forms of violence have to be collectively addressed within the academy. Um, I would now pass on to Raf, a lecturer in the department who will be chairing this evening and uh, looking forward to hearing or reading you all in the Q&A. Thanks, Joanna. Everyone can hear me okay? A nod? I hope so. Okay, right. So first things, it's really a big honor to be invited to chair tonight's talks on behalf of the whole paper team. So I'm really excited about uh, both this evening and the forthcoming presentations over the next week. So really like a, a massive shout out to Chloe, Victoria, Emily, Joanna and Alice for their incredible work in organizing this. I'm like genuinely proud and excited about it. I feel that it's going to be both something really vital uh, for all of us here and for our department as well. So before we start a few things, um, so first, what the team wanted to kind of get over is that whilst these topics are like really important and serious, we also want to make sure that today is informal and enjoyable for everyone. So a space where we can discuss fundamental issues in an intimate, warm and welcoming way. So please feel free to engage with the chat as you've all been doing amazingly already. It's been great to hear uh, everyone, uh, where everyone's from, where you are. Um, and if you have any specific questions, please use the Q&A box um, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, which I can see a couple of people already have. So we'll be having a 30 minute Q&A at the end of the session uh, after the three talks rather than stopping in between. There'll also be space for breaks in the evening and I'm sure there'll be some technical hiccups. This is the first session, so we'll just flow through them and please bear with us. At the end of the session, there'll also be a space for speakers to plug any resources or organizations that have emerged from today's talks. So as Emily and Joanna said, today's seminar is entitled Introduction and Institution, and will focus on the legacies of colonialism and exploitation in anthropology, and how these persist today within academic institutions, including, of course, our own department. So our speakers are Professor Linda Tuhiwai Smith, author of Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples, Toyan Agbetu, a scholar activist who is currently completing his PhD in anthropology here at UCL, and Daenery Arias, a zero hour contract UCL outsource worker and member of the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain. Uh, to note, Daenery's talk will be in Spanish and will be translated by Geordie paragraph by paragraph. And I'll give full bios of each of our speakers uh, before each of their talks. Some final housekeeping before we start. So as I said, this is an open space, encouraging productive yet challenging dialogue about complex and often uncomfortable issues. With this in mind, Please engage, but please engage thoughtfully and with integrity. There is no room for racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism and classism in these seminars. Marginalized folk are under no obligation to educate you, share their experiences with you or comfort you during these seminars. And we ask you to be mindful of any assumptions you make about others present at these events. Uh, we'll have two moderators, as I said, one managing the chat uh, and the other on hand if any issues arise. Uh, questions will be submitted separately to live chat, as I said, and it's also, of course, possible to send questions anonymously. To also note, we will be recording tonight on that note of anonymity. Also, as a trigger warning, these series may include content that is distressing or uncomfortable uh, as we address examples. There we go, so it's just started. Uh, so this series may include um, uh, content that is distressing or uncomfortable 
uh, as we address examples of microaggressions in our department, intergenerational trauma, and other forms of violences as a result of our discipline's colonial history. If at any time you need to leave the room, log off, take some time for yourself, please feel free to do so. The host can readmit you, just send them a message if you're able to, so they can keep an eye on the waiting room. Also, as I'm sure you all know, all tickets to paper events are free, but we are, we are asking those that are able to, to make a financial contribution to the Free Black University, a project that exists to redistribute knowledge and act as a space of incubation for the creation of transformative knowledge in the Black community. Every contribution is welcome. Uh, I or someone else will put uh, the link to the Free Black University in the chat. So finally, to start, uh, now that's uh, kind of done with. So uh, known as the mother of Indigenous studies, Professor Linda Tahiwai Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodologies, is considered one of the most influential texts on Indigenous research, let alone on social science methodology itself. One of the world's leading scholars and founding thought leaders of Indigenous studies, Indigenous, indigenous education, and Carol Papa Maori research, Professor Smith's work demonstrates her commitment to the well being, intellectual, political self determination of Indigenous peoples. Her books, articles, and lectures are key texts in universities around the world. The introduction to her decolonizing, decolonizing methodologies text, now 20 years old and on, I believe, its third edition. Um, is actually one of the key readings in our own student initiated decolonizing the curriculum course in the department of UCL. So the paper team invited Linda because of this depth of wisdom, knowledge and experience, which is so foundational to the theme they wanted to explore in this seminar and which also spans other um, ideas across the events in the series. So really there couldn't be a better person to start this series of talk. So uh, Linda, over to you. Enakoto katoa. Greetings from New Zealand, Aotearoa. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I can see from the chat there are people literally all over the world, except I can't see anyone from Aotearoa or Australia. And like me, they must have just been getting out of bed. So I acknowledge all of those of you who are in different time zones. I'm sitting in the hotel in Wellington. New Zealand is kind of operating at a level of normality, but I just want to speak uh, to everyone around the, the context in which we're meeting uh, online. And that is in relation to the coronavirus and the huge impact it has had, particularly on indigenous and marginalized communities communities where there are people of colour, people who are on the edges of society, uh, who have been exposed in this pandemic to even more um, violence, if you like, of uh, in inequality and inequity in terms of the delivery of health. One year ago, I was travelling to Germany and to the US uh, to talk about decolonizing methodologies. I find it difficult often um, traveling, particularly into Europe and the UK. To me, they are countries that are the sort of founders of imperialism as we experienced it uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Pacific. And it does my head in a little bit to think about what decolonizing means for the empire, if you like, for uh, places that have built their entire identity and being on their imperial uh, positioning. So I've, to me, that's kind of challenging because if you dismantle colonialism in those contexts, what's left? Um, that, that's one question that I'll ask. But before I proceed, um, as well as sitting in a hotel in Wellington, I'm wearing pink lipstick and a pink top. I have glasses and I am a reluctantly gray woman. Um, so I change my hair color all the time. <clears throat> and since we were in lockdown a year ago, I've been growing my hair and enjoying um, 
the fact that I only have to dress for the top half uh, these days when I'm speaking and teaching and I can wear my pyjama bottoms uh, during a Zoom conference. So <clears throat> greetings to all of you. And I hope that the seminar series that you not only contribute to it, but um, it helps you think through some of these uh, issues. I think Raphael, yes, the, the book is about to come out in its third edition. And, um, you know, I was quite, when I'm asked by the publisher to do another edition, I always have to pause and think, well, does it still speak um, as a book? You know, I don't really want to just keep doing new editions if it's pointless and it's about the publisher rather than the ideas. And I did uh, something different this time, which was consult uh, young postgraduate students who are Indigenous at every conference I went to, to ask them, you know, what the challenges for the new generation of scholars is. And so it surprises me, shocks me, um, that the sort of agenda of decolonizing is still present, still important, and has not really reached or penetrated the level of depth that I think um, such an agenda has to reach. Universities are amazingly complicated uh, institutions who are extremely difficult to reform. I say who as if they're people, um, but they <clears throat> probably represent the, the sort of complicated ways in which colonialism you know, not only extracted and destroyed um, and reformed and restructured uh, cultures, societies, nations um, all across the sort of um, southern part of the planet, if you like, but that was used to build, to reinvent to reimagine and shore up the institutions within Europe itself. And so one of the things that does my head in when I, when I visit Europe is the extent to which that is very much taken for granted uh, part of a country's identity and their sense of being, their sense of um, confidence in, in where they sit in the world and how they see their cultures. So that's always a challenge, I'm sure, not just for me, but for others. Um, the other thing that always surprises me when I come to the UK uh, in particular is how much I know about the UK, even before I arrived, how much of its history I was taught in schools, how much of its geography, how much of its culture, um, how much of that was in my thoughts, my imagination, my language, my reading, uh, my understanding of um, literature. And, you know, that sort of sense of colonialism being in every part of our being. If you are colonized, it's in our language, it's in our thoughts, our emotions, um, it seeps through every part of us. So decolonizing has these kind of structural, systemic, political uh, elements, and then also these deeply personal, emotional, um, physical um, sort of elements that, that, uh, that we sort of have to constantly question and constantly reflect upon. And I think the, the book Decolonizing Methodologies um, attempts to show some of that. I mean, I wrote it, started writing it as a master's student, 
Um, I then wrote uh, more as a PhD student and then finished it after I had completed my own PhD. Uh, I don't, it doesn't claim to be uh, what activists need um, in their work uh, as um, anti-colonial activists, but it does speak specifically to the ways in which research, knowledge, uh, academia, uh, methodologies are used to perpetuate uh, colonial ideas and structures for the way that we think and the way that we feel. Um, I think when um, the book first came out in 1998, 1999, um, really the, the main audience for the book was Indigenous scholars who they got what I was talking about. They understood what I was trying to say and they gravitated really to the second half of the book. And, and that's a very sort of practical response because I think, you know, it's very, you can approach decolonizing quite a romantic idea that you're going to, you know, dismantle colonialism. But the question that I think is also important is, so what do you do the next day? What do you do the next day? What do you learn the next day? What do you, um, how do you organize? How do you feel about yourself? And what work do you have to do to build the, the new reality of the next day and the day after that. And it was put to me by one of our activists in a, in a group that I belong to, who quite literally said, you know, when the Treaty of Waitangi is um, the constitutional platform of New Zealand, what, what are you going to do? And he pointed to each of us and we all got a fright. Um, because that's a very practical question. And it presents to me in a, in a sort of real life sense, the huge amount of work that has to go in to a decolonizing agenda, that it is an intergenerational program of work, that in a way we can't predict where it might take us because we have to create that pathway collaboratively with others, but it has to take us to a better place than where we are now. So one of the reasons I say that is because it's not just saying, well, uh, we'll just remove white people from the picture. The issue is white people are in our own bodies. Um, they have disrupted our own identities. They've intermarried with us. They have created uh, in some colonial colonizing contexts whole new uh, groupings of identities of people who did not exist before colonialism arrived. You know, people who in New Zealand used to be called half castes, but in some countries, those became the elites uh, once the British left or the French left. So even in our bodies, even in our blood, um, colonialism leaves this very powerful legacy that um, we have to sort of think about all the time when we're trying to address um, colonialism in academic institutions, you know, which has been my place of work and my academic home for about 40 years now. And I would like to say that I, you know, walk away into retirement having achieved something in terms of decolonizing the academy. But I'm not that confident I have. I mean, it's great all of you are interested in it, that people are still talking about it, but I was, you know, struggling with this 40 years ago. And I know other scholars were struggling with this 60 years ago and 100 years ago, that it's really hard work. It is intergenerational work. And there is this huge kind of denial, uh, reluctance and power system 
that makes it really, really difficult to decolonize curriculum and decolonize the whole structure of universities, how universities work. Because it's to me, it's not just about disciplines and academic knowledge and theory and methods. You know, that's what as students we experience, that's what as staff we we um, put our, our love and our attention to. But we exist in, in institutions and these institutions have been created to support that sort of racist and colonial curriculum. And so, you know, when I'm thinking of decolonizing a university, and at the moment I'm writing a, a report on our own university about this, it is the entire university that I think we have to focus on. And that means HR, finance, um, for goodness sake, even the gardens in many universities I've been to are laid out in a European style. And in settler colonial countries, they have destroyed indigenous landscapes to create these kind of settled European style university grounds, you know, that, that universities have a certain look um, about them. So every part of a university has to be rethought and reimagined and has to reconcile itself with its past. And those pasts are complicated, as you know. Um, in some universities, it's easy. You can point to a statue um, who represents a colonial figure. You can point to the name of a building, you know, who a scientist who was in the eugenics movement. And you can focus on those kind of symbolic uh, representations of colonialism. But it's when you get into the meat of what is it that really has been taught? Where did those ideas from? I mean, eugenics um, fueled pretty much all, all knowledge that we have about human intelligence, you know, and social welfare, um, care of young children and vulnerable people, that these theories have seeped into all kinds of taken for granted aspects um, of, our, of our lives. And those are the things that are hard to dismantle because people have invested their own knowledge in that. Their own knowledge rests upon that. And if you whip that platform away, um, you leave people stranded. And that's not a good place. I think some of, some of you have been around since the 1960s and 1970s in an era of social activism. Uh, certainly, I think what was learned, uh, particularly in uh, New Zealand in the anti-racism movement of the 1970s is you can create better racists out of an anti-racism movement if you don't think critically not only about what it, the analysis is, but what is it practically people need to do the next day, the next day? What is their program of work? Because if you leave people high and stranded, they default back to what they were with a more sophisticated rationale for why they do what they do. You know, so out of activism are some hard, gained lessons about the sustainability of a social change program, uh, a political change program like decolonizing uh, the academy. I think it's great to have the discussions about what to do. It gets harder when you're presented with the opportunity to reimagine your curriculum, reimagine your degree structure, what would your foundational uh, knowledge be in your program, whether it's um, anthropology as a whole or the dimensions of anthropology, where would you begin to start? Who are the key theorists that you would bring to the center? 
uh, who would help set the platform for an undergraduate program, a postgraduate program. You know, what are these new scholars going to be concerned about? Uh, what kind of language do they use? What is their research agenda? I mean, the last thing I think people in places like maybe Latin America, here in Aotearoa and the Pacific is a whole lot of reformed uh, graduates decolonized, you know, coming out of the north and descending on the south again. Uh, but with a sort of, you know, we've got the answers. And the, the whole point of some of this is to learn you don't have the answers. What you have are skills and you have to wait to be invited. And you may never be invited. Or you might be invited to do something really different. So it's not just learning a knowledge system, it's learning a whole new way of being, a new way of thinking, a new way of relating to others, to knowledge, to work, to the kinds of um, projects that you might want to undertake. And as I said, that's not a simple task. It's a very responsible task. Um, it requires a great deal of support, two steps forward, three steps back, one step forward, pause, reflection, review, tentatively, you know, move in another direction, review, you know, and slowly as people kind of learn to think differently, begin to sort of move into the projects and the areas of work uh, that need to be done. And how do we produce that generation inside the entire university when, you know, we know some disciplines just refuse to change, are going backwards as fast as they can. And the, the moment you give them an opportunity, they entrench because so much of the modern university is about capitalism and uh, money and entrepreneurship. Um, the race for the vaccine for me is a good example of what universities are actually expected to do these days, which is produce these easy solutions under pressure uh, without necessarily addressing the ethical questions of, you know, the questions I would have of vaccines, for example, is um, in their case control studies, how many people in the control group got the virus and were hospitalized and died? We, I'm sure the data's there, but, you know, we know the, the emphasis is on how many people got the vaccination and didn't go to hospital and didn't die. That's, that's the story that's been told, not the story about the other group. So, you know, in these methods that have been used, case control, um, these scientific methods, you know, they're once again rising because of our focus on a particular crisis at the moment with the coronavirus and this ratification of a particular kind of science. But the reason people of colour, Indigenous people, are dying of the virus, that's, that's got to do with politics, with power. It's got nothing to do with science. It's got to do with how governments have governed. It's got to do with their systems that are ingrained with um, any, you know, a commitment in a way to inequity, a commitment um, to privileging the wealthy. And, and universities are implicated in that vision of society, in my view. So I think I'll stop there. I've, I'm sure I've done more than my 20 minutes. Um, 
hopefully I've thrown out enough provocative ideas for people to chew on and think about and talk about um, in the session. So I'm just going to stop there, Raphael, and hand it back to you. Linda, thank you. That was like incredible. Like my stopwatch was just kind of going on. I was totally ignoring it, obviously. Um, there's so much to unpack there. I mean, you, you said briefly you, know, you didn't know whether your book was still relevant today. I mean, I was reading it today and I can confirm on my behalf, at least it's more relevant than it's ever been. Um, so again, please, um, you know, feel free to get questions in the Q&A now if you want to kind of save them up um, for uh, the chat. Um, and the question and answer afterwards. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go um, straight on to, uh, to ask Toyin um, to speak. So Toyin uh, Agbetu is a scholar activist, community educator, and the founder of Ligali, a pan-African human rights-based organization that challenges Afrophobia and the misrepresentation of African people, culture, and history in the British media. So he's an award-winning independent filmmaker who participates in numerous panel and broadcast discussions addressing Afrophobia, reparations and decolonization and the reparation of cultural artifacts. Uh, he acquired his uh, MA in, in Social and Cultural Anthropology at UCL for his research on the cultures of protest and completed his undergraduate degree in education and community development at the University of East London. Toyin's currently based uh, in our anthropology department, in fact, submitted his PhD, PhD yesterday, I believe, uh, on gentrification and institutional activism in East London, supervised by Hayley Geismar. I should also say uh, that um, in the last three days, I found out that Toyin is also a seminal music producer uh, within the British uh, underground dance music scene. In fact, one of the pioneers of a genre called street soul and recording under the names Nemesis, Shades of Black and Witch Doctor, amongst many others. I say that because uh, Toyin, I've been listening to your music nonstop for the last three days. Um, so uh, we're super lucky to have Toyin here uh, after Linda's really incredible uh, opening. Um, so Toyin, uh, I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much, <laughs> and thank you, Professor Linda. I mean, that was amazing. If we uh, were out, kind of like you know, physically in the same space, I think you would have just dropped the mic at that stage. It was awesome, and your work is always relevant. It's on my shelf, and it kind of like helped greatly during my process. So. I thank you immensely for that. Um, yeah, right, I just finished literally the uh, submission yesterday. And so um, I'm doing something today that I normally never do. I, I'm, I'm actually, all day I've been writing up, kind of answering the questions for today. And I normally, as you know, just ramble directly to the to, to, to the camera or to the people and, and, and that way. But I've got something I've written and I can do my rambling in the Q&A. So Raphael, what I'm gonna need you to do is if I go over time, because you know how bad I am, just pull me up and I'll just freestyle the way, the way out. But I'm gonna try it. You know, I'm, I, I'm not really a fan of reading as, I'm, as, a, as, as, as a form of presentation, but you know, it kind of, it came from the heart. And because some of those questions are about the institution that I'm actually in right now and the department I'm in right now, and they're very critical questions. And I, I do want to have some friends left afterwards. Um, I haven't checked this with the lawyers, so um, I'm just going to go. Um, just keeping with convention, um, I'm a brown African skinned male. Uh, I have salt and pepper beard. Um, and uh, I think it's a greenish, turquoise ish. African traditional top. So let's get started. Um, it's really weird reading, but you know, anyway. the first question was, what is the problem with our institution? Which is a big one. So University College London, UCL, was founded in 1826, and it was done on a radical premise, framed as a secular alternative to the Oxbridge institutions. It was London's first ever university, and it differentiated itself from the existing ivory towers of academia by boldly welcoming students, irrespective of faith or gender. The catch is it was established on the premise of Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism. And this really asserted this doctrine, this idea of ethics that said that all actions are morally right if they maximize the likelihood of happiness. That should be fantastic, shouldn't it? I mean, that's, that's, that's you know, if that's the university's presentation on that. However, Bentham's theory had a counter argument. It was here where we see the original sin of institutions like UCL, with a legacy rooted in Britain's experiments with colonial enslavement, exploitation, and regional maldevelopment, that I have an issue. 
You see, for Bentham's theory of utilitarianism also stipulated that those who promote unhappiness or pain were morally wrong. There was no exceptions to this rule. And this utilitarianism at the time was a huge fad amongst politicians. Now, like other institutions of its day, UCL was faced with a choice. It could stay true to the entirety of these principles and face the political ramifications of this ethical decision, or support the active involvement with a British state engaged in colonial crimes. Now, UCL was not faced with Hobson's choice. Its very foundation was premised on passionate, almost activist-like approach to creating knowledge. But as we now know, sadly, UCL chose to promote and develop systems of unhappiness and pain. Moreover, through the work of men like uh, Pearson and Galton, it was actively complicit in establishing the pseudoscience of eugenics in an effort to breed out diversity and create the so-called perfect human being. It hosted the eugenics record office in Gower Street, and it inspired the formation of the German Society for Race Hygiene by Alfred Poletz in Berlin. It was only this year, on the 7th of January, 2021, that the outgoing president and provost, uh, Professor Michael Arthur, made a formal apology on behalf of the institution for its role in the development, propagation, and legit legitimization of eugenics. Now, this was a welcome gesture, which was long overdue, but I, I kind of see it much as Twitter banning Trump from its platform while he flailed around in the death throes of his presidency. There's a kind of bitter taste that follows once you kind of reflect on why wasn't that decision taken earlier? You know, they, were, they, they, you know, they enabled him for such a long time. Well, let's move on. Today, UCL is a bastion of gifted academics, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Its steering risk-taking research enables the co-creation of knowledge with real and tangible impact on our social worlds. I actually wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the, that creation of knowledge that delivers social good. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop freestyling, keep reading time. It's, it's decision to remove the names honoring academic racists occurred before the wide awakening brought about by the last international wave of Black Lives Matter protests and the tragic deaths of people like uh, George Floyd. So, I mean, this was something it was doing without prompting and I commend it for that. But nevertheless, it would be wrong to suggest its journey of moral atonement is over. It has only just begun implementing holistic systems of reparation. As an institution, UCL collectively and openly recognizes the presence of inequality, discrimination and exploitation operating within its walls. However, like most sites of inherited hegemony, it's still so seduced by the rewards of high status, privilege, and most importantly, power, it continues to enable such inequities to persist. The problem with institutions like UCL, although it would be unfair to assert it is alone in maintaining this transmission of this disease of social incivility, and that's me being polite, is that UCL in particular struggles to resolve its inability to include free radicals without neutralizing their spirit. It is too frightened of engaging with counterpublics, for example, in fear of learning which of its favored PR inspired innovations are really just acts of vanity. Worse still, and this is something we don't like to talk about, Many of its more principled gatekeepers are still so scared of taking risks, so they self-regulate from fear of being labelled emotional instead of rational. They worry about being, you know, labelled ethical instead of, you know, financially liberal. So they're always balancing this idea: is it money or is it ethics? They, 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 you know, they'd rather be seen as conservative instead of liberatory. And this, for a university which was actually founded on these radical principles, is quite, you know, quite a shame. The result is the institutionalization of social fads, and I call this act fadism. This is where genuine movements for social change and social action are actually reduced for huge social, political, or marketing optics as cultural moments. It is in this abuse of power and privilege that institutions like UCL, which use these social trends for justice as rebranding opportunities, become guilty of attracting raw talent. You see, what happens that we see them, we think, oh my God, they're gonna do the right thing. And a lot of people with good intent join thinking that, yeah, we can work with this institution now. But instead of nurturing such people, these institutions mold them. And not in a manner that you know, refines them, but instead it redefines them. Then having extracted the most valuable elements of these human resources, 
They are then discarded with their work transformed into ethnographic fragments. And these are then placed on displays as trophies of past acts of inclusion. It's always the past. We will be doing, we are planning. Really, we are, we have, and forevermore we will be doing. And this is one of the risks we have to look out for with institutions. I think Linda spoke about this being what they do. They maintain, they, they keep regurgitating that system. It's designed to do so. So as a scholar, of, well, as a community of scholars, UCL is a hub of inspiring researchers involved in amazing academic innovation. However, as an institution of scholars, and there's a difference, it remains an elitist network of privileged actors seeking to preserve the status quo in a world that, let's be honest, is forever changing. So that's the first question. The second question, how is our department at UCL implicated in the broader ongoing conversations happening worldwide which address the violence of anthropology and also what kinds of embedded colonial mentalities still run through it? How are they enacted? What do they reproduce? Big questions. Okay, sorry friends, I'm gonna go there. <laughs> um, although UCL brands itself as a global institution, its main produce, like most Western universities, is the manufacture of academic whiteness. Even if we entertain the false dichotomy between there being a so-called hard and soft science, the mythical quest for objectivity based on empirical data falls prey, not only to our limits of interpretation and analysis, but also our lack, if we allow it, of imagination for extraordinary possibilities. And for that's what we're supposed to be doing, creating new knowledge. That's a sci-fi note in me. If I sounded hard on you as an institution, it is because as a whole, I can hear it think. Mary Douglas talks about this really well. There are those that consider its strength to be a rational administrative brain that tolerates an academic heart to enable a body to function. But this is really a really a reductionist view of what makes UCL work and it's flawed. You see, because each department, again, Linda spoke on this, every member of staff, each student, each worker, each interlocutor, they're all equally entwined as interdependent entities. We don't always recognize it. And I'm so grateful for the paper team making sure that the panel reflects that interconnectedness and from all levels. But that's the reality. See, moreover, when we view this holistically through the ethnographic fragments that we collect and we see around the building, in the parks, in our offices, in our staff rooms, in our cafes. We think some of them have been gifted, some of them have been stolen. And my department, just as your department, is connected to the people that infuse those objects with meanings, with knowledge, and, and they still communicate with us through time and space. So it's not just the objects in the museums that we think about or in those collections that we think about. It's got to be everything. The things that adorn the walls, the things that adorn that are in the toilet, the things that are written on the walls in the toilet. Sometimes there are some really insightful philosophies that come out. Uh, sometimes some crude stuff as well. Um, but we know that they're valuable. And this is the point I'm trying to make. We, we know this because we don't throw them away. When we see these objects, we, instead what we do, we hoard them in an act of possession, of control, really of power. And, and, and you know, we, we're not really, really sure that we have the validity unless we have the consent from the original creators to keep hold of them. And so I say it's in these tactic actions of which we do not speak, that we do not actively question as knowledge producers and that we do not seek to resolve as human beings that enables the acts of unconscionable violence that plead the production of scientific data as some kind of neutral act. It is not. And we have to be clear about that. We can keep saying I'm following the science or producing science and that's the mission. It's not neutral. Science has never been neutral. Coming from a background of critical pedagogy and community development, I've personally found anthropology a breath of fresh air. Of all the social sciences, and I'm going to use that cliche, it is the most humanistic. It's actually also hard coded for praxis. We as the instruments are often there, directly interfacing with the world beyond, sometimes the world at home. But what we often neglect to do is reflect on the world within. Now, it's funny for us ethnographers, we strive to be objective, to maintain cultural relativity, but we can't. Our presence in other domains always has consequences. Our witnessing as a process always affects the outcome. 
And yes, I am referring to that cat in the box, if you know about Schrodinger's, uh, I won't go there, doing a nerd thing, you know. The paradox lies in the fact that we would question the study of atoms, of atoms with a pair of binoculars. If you saw me doing that, you'd think, uh, that's not really gonna work. But there is so much silence when we use a methodology predicated on a racist ideology that produces papers analyzing the world's diversity without living or practicing meaningful acts of inclusivity. These are the reasons why Linda's book are still and so relevant because the methodologies that we use come from those institutional days back when UCL made that bad choice. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I love anthropology. Nonetheless, the biggest challenge a discipline face today is how to resolve this internal struggle between engagement on human issues at an aesthetic level or an ethical practical level. I mean, let me explain. You see, for a long time, expressions of applied anthropology and gay anthropology, and of course decolonizing anthropology, has been siloed as the plaything of some naughty irrational faction within. And it's got to be tolerated in small doses instead of it actually being embraced and mainstreamed, made normal, recognizing that it's the natural development, it's the only development we should be moving towards. In rendering the diversity of human existence palatable to whiteness, the means through which we as anthropologists are doing our social ledger of accomplishments, it, it, this is unacceptable. It, it, it's kind of like uh, uh, enabling us to, 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 to lie to ourselves and create a, a moral argument that we can dance through life blind the privileges that we have. I think not, I think we shouldn't be doing that. I think just as the so-called hard sciences, we know our privileges demand that we enable others to know too. And, I, and I, a perfect example, if we discover the benefits of penicillin, despite there being side effects, we aspire to use it to heal. Linda spoke about the vaccine. We create a vaccine, we recognize that it can heal. We also had to talk about the negatives of it, but we use that knowledge. Likewise, when we discover theories of injustice and possible solutions, we should aspire to share those theories so others, maybe us, maybe not, but certainly we've got to move it wider in our departments so that they can share them, maybe even help enact them. As, ethnog as ethnographers, we often go into the field, break bread, build relationships, and when everything is done, return home to write from a distance about the lack of agency of others, to differentiate ourselves from the colonialists who used that information to exploit. Well, surely we have the opportunity and responsibility to use that information to empower. And where our interlocutors have gifted us with testimony or artifacts enabling us to travel with their story, surely sharing the embodiment of their spirit using what little authority we have is an ethical act of reciprocity and it's the moral thing to do but i'm, I'm going to pause there on that particular issue for it'd be unfair for me to allow these charges to be laid solely at the department that has been my academic home for almost half a decade the problems i found there are replicated across the country and in anthropology departments across the world at ucl to do nothing means to let the status quo remain and then the values that the institution has the department inherits um i'm going to leave that there when it comes to my department all i'll say is that it, it inherit oh, no I'll, I'll leave that there because i can ramble the last bit the last question would uprooting them affect the social experience and notions and knowledge production how can we affect change now this is my favorite part analyzing the problems is always easy Okay, very quick. So I'm not a Marxist, although I do like me some Gramsci. Um, however, what I will acknowledge is that Marx is on the money. Well, that's capital. When he said, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but on the contrary, their social existence that determines their consciousness. You see, the problem with decoloniality and movement for decolonizing is that we all have allowed them to become formally co-opted and rebranded as activist endeavors. Many of us, and that are, and I'm really talking about anthropologists and historians here, but many of us have inadvertently failed to re-establish such processes as, as acts of what in 2012 Arturo Escobar referred to as, and I'm going to really probably mispronounce it, Buen Viveur. And basically he defines this as a concept of collective well-being of humans, uh, non-humans, our communities, and a natural environment. 
Now, I've been a pan Africanist for many years and listening to academics speak of development using transactional terms and activism using temporal terms actually just hurts. Witnessing the words of Fanon, especially in, in concern and violence, being reduced to acts of fadism, which avoids addressing the fundamental messages that he makes about the propagation of narratives that use uh, cultural domination to coerce entire nations into accepting racialized concepts of black inferiority and white supremacy hurts. As scholars, we have failed in a spectacular fashion to communicate that ethnicity is not limited to groups named as ethnics or in the UK, Bamians. As scholars, we have failed to explain that activism, especially as it was originally de uh, defined in the 17th century, was defined as a lifelong process. Its success is not measured and never has been measured in objective terms, but in whether it manufactures hope and relationships that leads to social change. That said, I want to close with a reference to what took place in Bristol last year with the statue of Colston. And this is tying into what, how Linda closed. It's a really important point. When we remove statues from the public realm that are symbols of violence, of colonialism, we are actually engaging in a decolonizing process. But it's an incomplete one, you see, because unless we are also removing the systematic processes that erected it in the first place, and moreover, the power that enabled it to stay there, we have not completed that job. And this applies to academia and of course, across anthropology. You see, during colonialism, the knowledge gained through participant observation by anthropological practice was used for unethical violent purposes. Today's decolonial praxis requires that anthropologists and all those involved in social justice courses use the knowledge co-produced through participant observation for practical ethical use. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from Emil Carker Brown. He says, always remember that the people are not fighting for ideas nor for what's in people's minds. The people fight and accept the sacrifices demanded by the struggle in order to gain material advantages, to live better and in peace to benefit from progress and for the better future of their children, national liberation, the struggle against colonialism, the construction of peace, progress and independence are hollow words devoid of any significance unless they are translated into a real improvement of living conditions. Um, I hope my rambling there has been of some use and I'm going to be quiet now. Thank you, Toyin. Yeah, I'm clapping alongside Linda and whooping alongside Chloe in the chat. Um, it's I, I, I'm not sure how to continue chairing after having to follow Linda and then Toyin and kind of chair. It's kind of a, kind of a horrific position to be in. But that was amazing, Toyin. Thank you. Um, you know the way. I, actually, I'm re enjoying the the way that the paper team have created this panel because we're kind of we're going from the large and we're squeezing down, we're getting into the heart of, of UCL and now with our next talk gonna be going even further there. Um, so to mention, as I said earlier, we're gonna have our Q&A at the end, um, but do get your questions in on the Q&A button below. Uh, Linda has been answering some of your questions so far. Thank you for that, Linda. I'm also collating the questions as we're going uh, and I'll try and group them into kind of series of questions um, for the Q&A at the end as well. Um, so I also, sorry, forgot to visually describe myself as well. Um, so I am a 40 year old white Bamian male, I'm gonna steal Toyin's term there, um, wearing a blue shirt with uh, increasingly uh, long curly hair. Um, so um, Daenery Arias uh, was uh, born in Colombia uh, and migrated to Spain uh, where uh, she lived as an undocumented worker for seven years. After obtaining Spanish citizenship and due to the economic crisis, she migrated to the UK and has lived in London for eight years. Uh, she works as a zero hour contract cleaner at the residence halls of University College London, our university, and will be talking about her experience as an outsourced worker in the institution of UCL in a paper entitled Life on Zero Hours, the institution from Daenerys perspective. I also wanna thank Geordie Lopez, who is an organizer and caseworker at the IWGB Universities of London branch for undertaking the translation for Daenery and it will go paragraph by paragraph. 
So Denari and, and your, uh, Jordi, over to you. Thank you. So um, good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, one. Cool. ¿Me escucha? Ya, te escuchamos. Entonces, si quieres, hago la intro y ahora te, te aviso cuando empiezas tú, ¿vale? Uh, so, de, de so um, I'm a white meat training man hiding behind a beard and wearing also a blue shirt tonight. Hi. Um, um, so I, before introducing uh, Daneri, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the IWGB so that you have a little bit of background. But uh, essentially, the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain um, are a small union and that organizes with migrant uh, workers and gig economy workers and these branch in particular, the University of London branch, uh, has a long history of campaigning against outsourcing in higher education institutions and mainly organizing with precarious migrant workers uh, who are normally called unorganizable by other unions or other institutions. Um, We've been campaigning at UCL for quite a while, and, and before Daenerys started, we'd just like you to tell you about a, an anecdote. Um, before we went on strike uh, last year with about 300 workers, uh, uh, Michael Arthur, the former provost of UCL, was presenting a report on basically uh, the quality and diversity policies of the institution he represented, uh, essentially uh, showing off about how good the policies of UCL were in higher education. So we decided to attend with a few outsource cleaners and ask him about why uh, the our cleaners and other outsource cleaners who worked for UCL were not in the report and why there was no mention that they didn't even have sick pay. And when Michael Arthur uh, answered the question, he simply said that he was not aware of that. And it was the first time that he ever heard that there were outsource cleaners who did not have the right to seek pay. So I'm telling this to just mention an example on how racial and economic structures uh, simply render certain groups of people invisible, such as outsource workers, and how the fight that uh, a lot of our members have to do is about uh, fighting for a field of visibility and uh, coming into this field of visibility. But it was only when they took action and about 300 workers went on the biggest strike of outsource workers in the history of UK higher education. That their plight was seen for the first time and UCL had to acknowledge them. Uh, however, the, as the area will show, the fight still continues even if we've managed to increase uh, the pay, uh, annual leave and get finally full sick pay for most outsource workers. There's a lot to be won. Um, but the actions of our members have uh, brought attention to the inherently discriminatory and racialized dynamics that permeate uh, UCL as an institution, and as a consequence, uh, that also permeated the production of knowledge within it. So we thought it was important tonight that the Neri was here uh, as a zero-hour contract worker who's currently organizing with her colleagues at UCL to tell about what it means to work for an institution as UCL as an outsource worker. Taneri, cuando quieras. Bueno, muy buenas tardes para todos. Um, Good everyone. Pues, <laughs> eh, les voy a hablar de algo que es bastante, no sé, muchas cosas que no podemos pasar en este momento. Pero está eh, el eslogan eh, sacado es la vida en cero horas. So I will uh, tell you about a number of things tonight, uh, a number of things that are difficult to me, uh, but that I have entitled Life on Zero Hours. La institución, desde mi perspectiva, UCL, se presenta como una institución de sólidos valores una institución académica de prestigio que trata de hacer frente a sus legados coloniales, a su apoyo a las teorías raciales y a que buscar hoy apoyar a los grupos racia racializados que luchan contra la discriminación hoy en día. Declaraciones sobre las vidas 
negras importantes, sus compromisos públicos con la diversidad, igualdad, son algunos ejemplos. So the institution of UCL from my perspective is that of an institution that uh, shows strong values, a prestigious academic institution that seeks to uh, or pretends to address colonial legacies, its past support of racial theories, uh, and that pretends to today support racialized groups struggling against discrimination today, and statements about uh, black lives and uh, the alleged commitment to diversity are some examples of, of these institutions. Ver a UCL desde mi perspectiva es una realidad muy diferente, una realidad en que se mendigan derechos que otros consideran esenciales, una realidad en la que me, en la que me vuelvo desechable como trabajadora, como persona. Esta, es, esta desechabilidad define mi relación con UCL que va de la mano de una relación de simples y desnuda explotación. However, seeing UCL from my perspective is a very different reality, a reality in which I'm denied rights that other workers consider essential, a reality in which I become disposable as a worker and as a person as well. This uh, a relation of disposability defines my relation with UCL, which goes uh, hand in hand with a relation of simple and naked exploitation. Mi realidad es la de una mujer emigrante con un contrato cero horas, a la que por tanto se discrimina sistemáticamente, privándome de derechos básicos dándome peores condiciones y poniéndome bajo la dirección de empresas que no los ven más que como mano de obra mmm, ay, desechable. My reality is that of a migrant woman uh, with a zero contract who is therefore systematically discriminated against, deprived of basic rights, given uh, worse terms and conditions and placed under the management of companies that see us as nothing but as disposable labor. He sido despedida y reincorporada tras la intervención de mi sindicato. Se me ha negado material de seguridad al principio de la pandemia, he trabajado durante toda la pandemia sin derechos básicos, como vacaciones, y he, y he vivido constantemente bajo el temor de perder mi trabajo. Ay, perdón. That's all right. So I have been fired. Uh, and reinstated after intervention of, of my union. I have denied, I've been denied of uh, basic PPE at the beginning of the pandemic. I've worked the pandemic without basic rights as a holiday, and I have been in constant fear of losing my job mm. and my livelihood. Mm. Cuando quieras. Ok. Mi medio de vida, ah, bueno, es perder mi trabajo. Mi medio de vida, sabiendo que. Ay. Sabiendo que un periodo de enfermedad y vacaciones podría significar no encontrar un trabajo al que volver. Saber que tal vez. Mi hijo actualmente en paro podría perder el único apoyo económico que tiene con el dinero que yo le envío. So being under the constant fear of losing my job, my livelihood, 
knowing that a period of illness of holiday could mean not having a job to return to, uh, knowing that perhaps my son, who is currently unemployed, could lose the only financial support he has, which is the money that I send him every month. La vida de los trabajadores inmigrantes subcontratados significa vivir en un estado perfecto de incertidumbre, de inseguridad, en que no se sabe con certeza si tu, si tu sustento estará ahí mañana. La incertidumbre es el método más efectivo de control de sometimiento. El, el miedo se convierte en la esencia de la, re, de la relación laboral. Um, life as an uh, outsourced migrant worker means living in a perpetual state of uncertainty of insecurity, where you don't know for sure if your livelihood will be there tomorrow. Uncertainty is the most effective method of control of uh, subjugation. Fear becomes the essence of your employment relationship. Esta es la clave de la dinámica racializada, colonial, que persiste en UCIEL, una dinámica por la que los sujetos racializados están sometidos a la... Mm, Desachibilidad. Ay, me hago entender. Perfecto. Okay. Desachibilidad, inseguridad. La tranquilidad es un lujo al que los pobres no podemos acceder. A veces lloro, me siento abatida pensando el futuro incierto en la lucha diaria que significa teme, ten, temer constantemente la indigencia económica. These things that I've told you are key to understanding the racialized and colonial dynamics that persist at UCL. Dynamics uh, whereby racialized subjects such as myself are subjected to uh, disposability and insecurity. Uh, tranquility or peace of mind is a luxury that we, the poor, cannot access or cannot afford. Sometimes I cry, I feel uh, sad thinking of the uncertain future of the daily struggle of constantly fearing economic precarity of the institution. He visto mis compañeros enfermar de COVID para luego enfrentarse al despido por el mero hecho de encontrar un virus durante una pandemia al resto se nos se nos niega el pago si enfermamos o tenemos que autoaislarnos I have seen colleagues getting sick from covid to then face this missile for the simple fact of contracting a virus during a pandemic and the rest of us are now being denied of any pay if we get sick or have to self-isolate. UCIEL, prestigiosa institución, ha establecido que nosotros, los pobres emigrantes, en primera línea, ni siquiera tenemos derecho a aislarnos, enfermarnos. Ellos, no sin enfrentarnos, a las dificultades financieras y a la in indigencia. La realidad de esta pandemia es que UCIEL se basa en la explotación pura y dura de los trabajadores que ni siquiera tienen derecho a estar enfermos, son despedidos por estar UCL, uh, U, sorry, UCL, a prestigious institution, has established that uh, us, uh, the poor migrants on the front line, do not even have the right to uh, get sick or isolate ourselves. 
uh, or unless we cannot do so without facing financial hardship and uh, destitution. Uh, the reality of this pandemic is that UCL is based on uh, sheer and naked exploitation of workers who do not even have the right to be sick, who are fired for being sick. Supongo que calificar esto de relaciones colonial es solo acertado donde los sujetos racia, racializados somos inexistentes, invisibles, desechables. No encajamos formalmente en el marco legal que nos permitiría ganar nuestros derechos. I assume that calling all of these a uh, colonial relationship is only accurate, uh, whereby racialized subjects uh, are not existent, invisible, disposable, uh, subjects who do not formally fit into the legal framework that would entitle us to earn some basic rights. El problema racial de Uciel también ha sido palpable en su negativa a reconocerlos y reconocer a los trabajadores BAME como una parte legítima con la que debería negociar nuestros persistentes llamamientos para acabar con los contratos cero horas han sido ignorados. Las reclamaciones de despido han sido presentadas como mentiras y nuestra existencia, explotación y dolor simplemente tratados como algo inexistente. Um, UCL's uh, racial problem has also been uh, uh, evident in its refusal to recognize us and to recognize BME migrant workers as a legitimate party with whom UCL should negotiate. Our persistent calls to end our contracts have gone ignored. Claims about redundancies, uh, dismissals, and other issues, and the existence of our exploitation and pain are simply treated as something that does not exist. Las estructuras coloniales de explotación racial se caracterizan por los esfuerzos de las instituciones en negar la existencia del invisible, un estado de negación de nuestra existencia, pero al mismo tiempo de negación de la responsabilidad sobre nuestro dolor y explotación. Un ciel reproduce dolor, el abuso, la explotación, la inseguridad y la desechabilidad. The colonial and uh, racial uh, uh, structures at UCL are characterized by the effort of an institution to deny the existence of those who are considered invisible, a state of denial, but also of um, disavowal uh, of our existence, but at the same time, a denial of the responsibility that uh, the institution has for our grief and our exploitation. Uh, UCL reproduces grief, uh, abuse, exploitation, um, and insecurity. Esta institución nos utiliza como una fuerza de desechable que trabajará a través de una pandemia, trabajará a través de una pandemia y desaparecerá sin dejar rastros. Sin embargo, tendremos que defraudar a Uciel y a sus ambiciones coloniales. Dejaremos un rastro, nos haremos visibles, nos resistiremos a nuestra desechabilidad y haremos que todo el mundo sea consciente de que los legados coloniales raciales de Uciel están bien vivos en el siglo XXI. Um... This institution uses us as a disposable force that will work through a pandemic and disappear without a trace. Um, however, we will have to disappoint UCL 
and its colonial ambitions. Uh, we will leave a trace. We will make ourselves visible. We will resist our disposability. And we will make everyone aware that the colonial and racial legacies of UCL are alive and well in the 21st century. Thank you so much. So oh, Carry on, sorry. Sorry. Dale, dale, Daniel, si, tiene, si tienes algo más, acaba. Perdón, sí, tengo un pequeño párrafo. Toda institución, toda institución tiene que estudiarse desde, desde las relaciones que, re, que reproduce. Una pregunta, ¿qué dirían ustedes de UCIEL si la viviera desde mi punto de, si la vivieran desde mi punto de vista? Muchas gracias. Every institution uh, has to be studied from the perspective of the relations it reproduces. So I'm asking you a question. What would you say of UCL if you saw it from my perspective? Thank you very much. Just uh, Jordi, can you let Nary know that there is like so in the chat, there is just there are just messages and messages and messages just going up and up and up. So please let her know that there is you know lots to kind of read through and a huge amount of support here. And then Eric, nos están bombardeando mensajes de apoyo y agradeciéndote esta intervención extraordinaria que has hecho. Muchísimas gracias. Me ha costado un poquito y disculpe que me Emociono por lo que yo siento es muy fuerte. And thank por all of you. Vivir. And sorry, I, I, I had to stop, but I get very emotional because I've, I've lived through a lot. Um, Absolutely no need to apologize. Even sorry, I, I would just like to clarify one thing as uh, this is my role as case worker, but I, I would like to make everyone aware that. Uh, so Daniela is on a zero contract, which means she could lose her job at any point. Uh, we've gone through these many times, her and I. Uh, and she said she wanted to be here showing, having video on with her name, because uh, she says that everything she's saying is true. Um, so that she has no reason to hide anymore. And she's willing to take the risk for the sake of her colleagues, whom, uh, well, all of them, they decided yesterday that they are launching a campaign to end out uh, zero contracts at, at UCL. So you'll be seen some news and receiving an email from the organizers about how you can support. But yeah, they decided to take action after being invisible for way too long. So all support will be very welcome once we send you that email. Follow I mean, that was exactly the question that I, I had, Jordi, which has actually come from the paper team, but what the support you need directly from academics in the department that you're working in, because at least that's somewhere that we can directly address. Eh, María, entonces que nos preguntan que, qué tipo de ayuda necesitamos, qué tipo de apoyo nos pueden dar los académicos con la campaña que ustedes van a lanzar. No, pues nosotros necesitamos que primero que todo, pues que se nos valore, que se nos valore, se nos trate como personas que somos, que a Dios al ser hora, que eso no, que eso es, que eso es desechable. Eso es una falta de respeto para nosotros. Que, que, que nosotros tenemos tanto derecho como lo tienen todas las personas. Que por favor, a quien, a, a quien tenga que llegar, a quien corresponda, que nos apoye que somos muchos los que estamos viviendo esta situación. So, Cero horas, um, nada, nada. So um, all I'm asking is that uh, for us to be acknowledged and seen and to be treated as uh, humans and people that we are, and that means simply saying goodbye to zero contracts. They are a lack of respect uh, and we have uh, the right as anyone else to have uh, a proper contract. And uh, we just ask you for, please, to make sure that our plight is uh, heard by the relevant people, that you support us, 
uh, as it's uh, many of us who are living in this same situation that I'm in. I really want to thank um, the paper uh, team for initiating this and getting Denari and Geordie here. I think clearly, you know, as part of the commitment of the ARC, uh, this needs to become part of uh, our kind of our remit going forward. I also wanted to continue on a question for for all the panel. Um, so both Linda, Toyin. All right. Yeah. I'm going I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, hosts uh, license. We're going to take a few minute break just so everyone can have a little cup of tea, little toilet break, and then we're going to come back at six minutes past. So see you then. Daneri, nos tomamos una pausa y ahora volvemos con las preguntas en un ratito, ¿vale? Así que si te quieres descansar, lo has hecho súper bien. <risa> gracias, gracias, de verdad. ¿Estás bien? ¿Te sientes bien? Un poco emocional. ¿Quieres sí. tomar algo para beber? ¿Un poco de agua o un té? Tómate un descansito ahora, sí, María. Es que vale. Esas cosas me ponen muy mal. Súper sí. valiente. Tómate un descanso y te llamo Pero... cuando estemos con las preguntas, ¿vale? Ok, ok. Sácate okay. el, okay. el estrés. Sí. Oh, te, te voy a enseñar después lo, las dinámicas de teatro que hacía yo con miembros para quitar el estrés. Ah, muy importante. Vale. Ah, ahora te veo en, en cinco minutos, ¿vale? Ok. Hasta luego. Hablamos. Hello friends, we are heading back hopefully soon for a Q&A. Oh, that's my, uh, my WhatsApp going. <laughs> the, um, quickly, there's been quite a few questions about how we can access the recording, how you can access the transcription. It will all be available on our website after the fact, hopefully tomorrow, um, if I get up early enough. So you'll be able to <laughs> access that for free. Um, we're also on Facebook Live. I don't know what that's looking like for people. I can confirm that Chloe will not be getting up early tomorrow to put this online because that would be too much. It would be rude. It will, have, yeah, it will I get. Have, I have a meeting with a bottle of wine. 
at 9 p.m. I can't miss. I cannot be late to that. <laughs> I can't. Right. Yeah. So um, first, thank you, Chloe, for um, telling me to, to stop talking. Um, uh, Ioana, I'm going to pass over to you because you uh, wanted to um, say something briefly. Yes, I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, but maybe it's time now and it answers some questions in the chat as well, that if anything happens to Daneri because of her presentation, we will definitely run a campaign and send it over to all of you. And I'm sure you will support it. So she gets her, her job back. But this was a voluntary choice and a risk she knew she will be could be taken potentially. But that's why we're for, we're here for. Thanks, Joanna. And it's a voluntary choice that uh, anyone who's a staff member or a student at UCL here is now committed to, um, as I'm sure we all are. Um, so what I was going to say, um, everyone's done, Linda and everyone have been doing a great job at answering all the questions that are coming in, which is fantastic. So I hope people are getting all those responses. But just to kind of follow on, as I said, like a question that was kind of posed by the panel beforehand, um, and like clearly following on from Daenerys' amazing talk. Um, for all of the panel, so Linda, Toyin, Daenerys, Geordie as well, can you speak about specific instances of productive allyship that have been generative in your work to decolonize institutions or just to get through working within decolonial or colonial sites? So that's to all of the panel. Oh, I have to think long and hard about that. Um, the, the real challenge um, is a little bit of feedback noise. I think the real challenge, firstly, has been, say, for Indigenous peoples and our nations and communities to sort ourselves out and to stand together because colonialism fractures us, puts us on in different positions, different sides. So the first kind of level of relationships that we have to build and restore and uh, restore to trusting relationships are internal within ourselves. And then we then kind of rely on a kind of mishmash of allies. I wouldn't, you know, some allies are, they're not necessarily theoretically informed, but they are driven by a particular passion. Uh, they're not 100% reliable, but they can do one job really well. So, you know, allies in the end ha always have this privilege of being able to walk away, uh, being able to choose their battles, uh, being able to be ideologically pure, about what they're doing. And, um, and so that it always is a problem. So I think for Māori in the Māori context, we have strategically worked with say the anti-racism coalition groups um, to advance particular specific agendas. We've not had great allyship with say white feminists, they've usually fallen over fairly quickly, but we have had great allyship with individual feminist activists, you know. Um, so in terms of coalition building with groups, that's that often depends on the leadership of those groups and their um, clarity of what they're prepared to do. In terms of individuals, uh, yes, we've we've always relied on strong, consistent allies. But I was just answering a couple of questions, you know, about especially in the academy. There's so many agendas that go on in an in academic, individual academic um, situations, and you know, academics almost as a group are. Uh, let me say, fragile egos who, many of whom need allyship as more as an emotional support. And really in this kind of struggle, I think you said it, Raphael, at the beginning, we can't afford 
as the, you know, as marginalised communities to be propping up, um, looking after the emotional fragility of al of our allies. We need them to be staunch, strong, get on with the job, do the job, and furthermore, not ask for a reward. And also, you know, they need to stop. Let me put this really crudely, but this is what happens in our politics. Stop trying to build personal sexual relationships with our people and our movements. You know, build relationships that are ethical, that are political, and then, yes, over time, personal relationships do develop, but there is a, this strong element. Of, you know, it was one of the reasons some of our 19 activist groups in the 70s broke up uh, was actually because of the number of um, white women, essentially, who had um, come into our groups as girlfriends, lovers, wives um, of members of our group. And for Māori women, that um, just was a bridge too far. So I'll leave it there. Koyen? Wow. I mean, it's a really good question um and i struggled actually and that was really interesting um just trying to find a, a group I, I think in my experience and i talk as a scholar activist so i'm kind of one foot in one foot out uh i mean i build on, 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 on kind of what uh, linda spoke about uh there, there is an issue of not looking for the institution or not having an expectation for the institution to actually be a good ally recognizing that whenever it gets involved in a genuine grassroots process it often distorts it and at worst destroys it uh, because it co-ops perhaps the most vain or weakest elements within grassroots communities because all of our grassroots communities have you know you know a variety of different personalities in there and whether it's through personal relationships or it's financial remuneration they can actually sabotage it but where institutions have been really good allies is where people, and this, this is why I talked about how institutions think, it's where people inside those institutions act using their authority to facilitate uh, work outside without interfering. So they, they take a genuine, I won't say hands off, uh, um, but a genuine co-production, a co, uh, you know, uh, like a collaborative approach towards sharing the institution's authority at risk and often to themselves personally in their career personally and and that actually makes change because then what happens is that the radical actors and i'll use that term because i don't have a fear of radicality they are able to access you know libraries rooms internet uh, you know all the kinds of things inside institution outside institution because they have an institutional actor who's a, who, who's actually a true ally um, they might not be able to use the brand of the university which often works in their interest but this kind of like facilitates change it makes me think i mean how i came to you so i think about it was through the dismantling the master's house initiative it employed a radical actor uh, nathaniel tobias coleman and when he got too hot they got rid of him because they couldn't handle what he what he was doing but they brought him in because he was radical they couldn't contain the radicality but what he did while he was inside UCL was phenomenal it was the lunchtime sessions where we read about intersectionality where we talked about race and colors i'll put a link that we even built a website using UCL's resources so what happens is that there's a legacy of that. The institution itself didn't do the work. The institution wasn't the ally. It facilitated the, the allyship. And I think that's what we have to recognize. Sometimes we kind of like want to dream that the whole department's behind it, that the whole university's behind it. That's, we're not at that stage yet. If we see this as an eternal lifelong process, then I'm not a fan of inc incrementalism. I, I am a person who prefers revolution, but I rec I'm a pragmatist. So I recognize that we have incremental changes along the way. And each of those incremental changes is progress. And that's what we have to kind of like hold on to. And by making sure it's eternal, so it doesn't fall backwards, uh, we, we, we start moving towards the goal. And the last thing I'll say on it, a lot of uh, allies uh, who are 
uh, what's that, how did you say it, Linda? Emotionally fragile, who need a little bit of extra support when we are suffering ourselves, you know, kind of like everyone wants to go back to the new normal, not understanding that actually the, the old normal was killing me. And I have no rush to go back to an environment where my, my humanity and my vulnerabilities were just kind of ignored. Uh, uh, um, that's another issue uh, 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 um, that we have to deal with. I'll, I'll leave it there. I can hear myself rambling. Jordi or, or um, uh, Denari, I think you may have answered the question in terms of productive allyship already, but you feel free to, to, to jump in otherwise. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would say, so more, more in general, what we see is not so much that we find like radical allies in within institutions, but rather than a lot of academic actors, uh, including students, find some kind of um, yeah uh, radical ally in uh, movements of outsourced workers, in the sense that they suddenly realize the incoherent uh, approach of an institution or kind of the relations of production that permeate institutions where they study, and and we see how a lot of uh, students and academics or approaches uh, actually. Uh, kind of gain a lot of benefit from taking that perspective by engaging with us, et cetera. So I would say that sometimes it's the relation is not so productive for our members, um, but we, we always remain as some sort of uh, yeah, perspective about an institution. However, um, we did, for example, coordinate a big campaign called Boycott Senate House last year. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it was we had an end outsourcing campaign at the University of London Central Administration and outsourced workers that decided that uh, they would uh, call for boycott of all academic events right and whilst that put us at odds with uh, <laughs> yeah um, a lot of the academic world and we we developed a lot of very strong enemies uh, that still remember us to date we also had an incredible support from academics across the UK and a lot of UCU branches and we managed to pass a motion. And I think the, what was very effective there is that we were for the first time, rather than just a general engagement or statement, we were asking for a very specific action, which is just refuse to use this institution and ostracize them, given how they treat the outsourced workforce, right? And, and I thought, I, I think that that very specific action um, and the, the fact that we managed to develop relations with, with uh, academics through the unions uh, was extremely productive. And in the end, we, we managed to win that campaign by basically uh, ostracizing this, this institution and, and not organizing any events there. Um, so that was a, a, a good experience, but at the same time, we also experienced all the bad sides of academia by which we had uh, radical leftists um, or academics even uh, talks about migrant rights with migrant workers asking them not to go into the building uh, before before the conference. So we, we also saw the contradictions within academia, but we we obviously did develop very very uh, positive relationships with with uh, many uh, many universities across the UK and well, actually UC, uh, UCL we went on strike on a joint strike with UCU last year uh, in, a, in a show of force. Uh, and, and, and unity that was quite spectacular. So things can happen, but we have to work very hard towards very concrete actions rather than just general statements, et cetera. That's great, Julie. Thank you so much. Um, there's a couple, there's a question that's come up a few times, which um, I just thought I was muted there for a second, uh, which Linda has answered in, in the Q&A, but kind of Ludo just mentioned as well in the chat, which was about kind of the point you made uh, Linda about inadvertently creating better racists. Um, so I know you've answered that in the chat, but could could you develop that a bit further? I think it's very kind of you know leads on exactly what we've just been talking about, really. So I, I'd love it if you could develop that a bit further. Yeah, I mean, I think so. What I was referring to is the sort of anti-racist movement of the 1970s in New Zealand, where there was a wide range of kind of workshops, anti-racist groups. They were, they were working with hospital boards and, you know, the health system, the education system. Um, and it was very much based on a model of, I guess, individual awareness and, um, well, what I call built a lot around white guilt. 
um, you know, that sort of a approach, that model of anti-racism. And that sort of, in the end, was counterproductive because many of those who came through uh, those programs um, you know, it was it was an emotional journey that left them with our tools, actual practical tools and resources to kind of build what I call the next day and the, the sort of pragmatic work that they needed to do. And so in the void of not having tools, they kind of defaulted back to where they were, but they had a more sophisticated language and they were able to escalate um, some of those racist discourses quite purposefully because they kind of understood even more where some of you know racist terms come from they had the sort of history of that and they became you know virtually anti-indigenous uh, in in that emotional process there was a lot of guilt tripping and then there was a lot of expectation that you know, Māori people, Indigenous people would somehow be grateful that they'd gone through this program and be nice to them. And it, it just doesn't work like that. And, and that, so that model of anti-racism failed. And, and those who worked in that would, would accept that. So then they sort of reformed into a different group. Um, often built around our treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi. So we have Treaty of Waitangi Action Groups. There was also structural analysis groups that basically worked off Paulo Freire's model um, of, you know, analyzing structures of power in society and using those. And, you know, I'm involved in a sort of anti-racism work at the moment. And my answer in the Q&A was, so probably we've learned a lot from the past. Um, it's much more nuanced, much more understanding that you do have to take an individual on a journey, but they do need practical resources and tools. They need to understand that a three day intensive workshop does not make them an expert um, in, on themselves, let alone on racism, that they have to commit to a long term journey. And it's going to, they're going to be pitfalls in that journey that they have to pick themselves up from. So, and we have some very powerful mentors who can do that work as well. So I think it was um, kind of Wild West type programs in the 1970s. People were making it up. We borrowed a lot from the UK, uh, but essentially they were making it up as they went. And it was based on this liberal notion that oh, if only racists were aware, you know, that, that they're just ignorant. And if you can just give them knowledge, they'll change. Well, that's a flawed philosophy, right? It, it's much more deeply structured than that. Toyan, I wondered if you wanted to come in on that, maybe with your activism work, legali work. Yeah, I mean, I was just laughing at the last comment that was made because um, it, it's, it's perfect. Um, you know, when I think about the, the elections that took place in America, this whole idea that, you know, if, if people had only knew, known he was a racist, then they wouldn't have voted for him, um, doesn't really hold water with me because they, 75 million people, more people voted for the racist misogynist who now had a track record as president of being a racist. So, so yeah, this whole idea that ignorance can alone can eradicate racism is, is very naive. It's a much more complex issue than that. It's linked to survival, linked to exploitation, there's all other kind of issues. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, sorry, that was just a funny point. Um, I completely forgot the point I was gonna make and it was a good one as well. Repeat the question again, Raph, one sec. <laughs> Sorry, we were talking about this whole idea of kind of making better racists ah, that, problematic of kind of falling into that trap. That's it. Okay, I'll, I'll answer that in, in an anthropological context. It's, it's kind of like, I'm a nerd, so if you've ever read the Spider-Man comic, you'll know Uncle Ben tells Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. And anthropologists are kind of like trained as, akin to uh, a James Bond, as, as you know, with a level of cultural competencies so why bond can 
speak multiple languages, jump into helicopters, speed boats, Porsches, and just kind of interact with every community, any community, and seduce every single woman in the world. Um, anthropology is, we, we, we are trained to learn how to listen, how to participate, how to observe. And when we're doing that well, uh, when we're doing that with reflective practice, so we make sure we're not abusing those skill sets, then, 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 then it, you know, it's a great tool and we can aid movements. However, when we do it naughtily, when, when, when we're being pretty mischievous with it, and this is what happens when activists join or people join activist movements with this emotional need to do something because they feel impotent about things that are going on in the world and they feel they have authority and they want to change something, but they don't know what to do. So they join those who are actually oppressed. Uh, what they do with those cultural competencies, and this is what makes them better, is that you know they use the language, they learn the cultural context, they and then they they there's a danger that some of them become experts in fields. When I say experts, paper experts in fields which they've experienced for like a few months, or maybe at most a year of field work. Uh, well, no, w what you are, you know, and I and I'll take this on board myself is that you are a visitor who's been gifted with the present of having intimate relationships with people who have trusted you to share a snapshot of their lifeline, lifelong experiences. And they are trying to help you understand how to share that amongst your set to bring about change. When it happens, I don't want to go back to racism. I, always see, I know what I do, the sexism. When I, in the Gadi, I remember years ago, um, one of my colleagues said to me once, Toyin, um, you know, you've got sexist views. And I was really hurt. I was thinking I've got sexist views. And I, you know, I've made all this effort of doing the readings and kind of learning. And she said to me, but you've been socialized, you know, in a patriarchal system. It's impossible for you to reject those sexist views. They are embedded in you. And so it was then I learned it's actually, a, a, I had to actively engage in a process to make sure I counter any misogynistic trends I may have, because I don't want them. And, and, and I think sometimes as academics, just as people who join activist movements, there's a level of arrogance that we come from a position of power. We come from a position of heightened knowledge of awareness. And therefore, we can learn what it is that you're going through and become, like I said, experts on it. These are the challenges. I, I, I can see the time is running. These are the challenges that we have. And so it's being careful not to actually to have humility to have to be a bit humble not to actually assume that just because we have privilege because we have power that we can do better it, it doesn't quite work like that and that's when if that person disengages with the activist cause which is what happens in fadism they start committing crimes uh with full knowledge or full repertoire of the language the cultural context and can actually do more harm than when they actually came in so i've got i think we, we are kind of running out of time unfortunately um, but I have got a question which kind of a few again people have asked this question um, in the chat again some have been answered some have come up again but it's about it's a methodological question um, which is obviously opposite um, and it's come from a few questions a few people so for example this one in the chat um, I'm a black American woman situated in the west at University of London conducting my PhD in South Africa and though I feel that black academics and people are marginalized in the western context power is dynamic I am black and a woman. I know that I'm coming from a Western context to learn about maternity care in South Africa's most vulnerable women and birthing people. How can I approach reflexivity in this endeavor? How can I make sure that my methods and methodology do not impose a Western paradigm? So kind of following on from what Toyin was saying and other questions about decolonizing one's own training, uh, undertaking collaborative practice, you know, I suppose <laughs> it's an impossible question to even start, uh, you know, asking, but what could you say, Toyin, for just having finished your submitting a PhD, Linda, from your your you know your your history of research on this, how can we even start there? What are the practical steps to start there? Shall I start? Um, but that, that's a really those are good questions, and um, they're frequent questions that I get. Um, and I think the first skill that someone ought to have uh, is the skill of listening and being attentive and unlearning by listening. You know, just 
I, I think what a Western education does without people realising it is gives one a great sense of confidence about the methods and theories that you have. So you kind of feel compelled to use those. So it's very counter to all your training to sit, let that, what you've been taught, let that sit and marinate in you while you listen and open yourself up to new, new and different knowledges, different ways of thinking and learning and being patient with others and yourself you can't expect them to teach you either the, you know these other communities have better things to do with their time but I think a lot of it is patience and a western education does not teach patience it teaches impatience and entitlement um, it teaches authority you know that people are the authority of what they know so it is challenging to sit there and um, accept you're not an authority you're a beginner you've got some tools but you're a beginner and you have to begin slowly um, you know it's not to me it's not about apologizing uh, feeling um, you know inadequate in that to me, all the training that we should have as academics in the Western system, the least that it should deliver or the least it should do for us is make us humble. Because if there's one thing we should all have learned by submitting a PhD is we know not much, really. It, you know, like a PhD is not much of the world. We know a hell of a lot of not much. And if we kind of understood that and then going out in the world, that really we don't, we have so much more to learn. Um, we've got skills, but we have so much more to learn from others. And then I think it's how do you um, go with that? You know, how do you flow? How do you listen? How are you attentive? How do you use your skills of observation? good listening um, and I mean in our culture it's very simple how do you pick up a tea towel and what and help dry the dishes in our cultural center you start there you start with the broom sweeping the floor you start by serving others and then you begin to learn how to recognize um, what needs to be done so it is a different kind of apprenticeship, but I know people can do it. Um, they just have to check their entitlement and sense of authority over knowledge. That was so beautifully put. Uh, um, uh, there's not much more I can add. I mean, you know, we have, the training gives us skills, but it doesn't give us knowledge. And I think it's so important that we recognize the difference between the two. I think it's so important that we have that level of humility. And I think we're comfortable with that humility. We're, we're comfortable with that position because that's what causes the problems when we become insecure about that. When we, we, we start to misapply what we've learned or what we've been told because we feel that we have to be the font of all knowledge. You know, if we don't know something, I love, I'm actually, I just love grabbing a book. I love reading the journal article. I love researching to find out what I don't know. And then finding out there's more I don't know. Then you go down that rabbit hole. That, that is the joy of pure academic research, of actually searching for knowledge. But it has to come from the position. So like to the original person who asked the question about working in South Africa, you have to start from a position that you just don't know. But you trust yourself. And I, I said it when I was talking earlier that we are the instrument. And so every single one of us brings something you know, unique to this universe. And the way we interpret that knowledge, the way we, we, we interrogate it and synthesize it and then come up with different, it's quite magical. My yardstick is really simple when it comes to doing research. When I finish, when all said and done and I've written something, can I show it back to the person who I had the privilege of actually learning from? And if I feel in my heart that I've written something that's wrong, that's something that's not truthful or something that distorts what they're saying, 
then there should be reason for concern. And, and, and just stick to that. Trust yourself. You know, all the stuff that we know, it just gives us the skill set. Knowledge is, you know, that goes on forever. Thanks, Toya. And thanks, Linda. Uh, I'm going to go. I, I'm definitely see the time. Um, thanks uh, to everyone who's um, mentioning, uh, saying hi and goodbye in the chat. So I'm going to go briefly to Ioana, who's got a quick practical question. And then we're going to close with uh, Chloe and Victoria. So Ioana, please. OK, I would like, first of all, to thank you all for being here. And a little bit tokenistically, I want to ask on some practicalities of how we can embed this in the pedagogy. So I'm all for um, taking steps, pausing, reflecting, discussing. So I love this process. And I also question if really we can decolonize within the capitalist system. So there's all these issues that have been raised, but thinking a bit about how we can incorporate that, at least in the way we write, I was um, wondering if you can um, uh, position yourselves on maybe shifting a bit this, um, obsession we have with the ethnographic present. So if we would have to include first histories of the places we go, uh, assuming we go out to study, and also our histories, and also include a bit about our positionalities, maybe in a way of unpacking this ego position, or as a way of connecting the whole research uh, within this um, greater genealogies. And I also have a question for uh, Daneri. Um, if us, apart from our support to the struggles, which I think should be active and engaged um, as academics, but as, as humans, um, if our research could help somewhat. So for example, if we did field work with the managers of Sodexo, or we did field work with the union, would that produce knowledge that you think could be useful in your struggles? Thank you. Linda, Toyen, Denari. I mean, I can, I, I was, I, <coughs> was going to leave it for Denari, but I, I mean, um, just in summary, well, first of all, thank you for, for, for organizing this panel and inviting me for such wonderful discussions and, 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 and participants as well. Um, practical, yeah, uh, making the issues visible. Visibility is key. Uh, injustice thrives in the darkness. It thrives when people are unaware of what's going on. And not all anthropologists, not all academics want to be engaged in the front line. That's not always their strength. Some people are so good at analysis. It's one of the things when I write, give a lecture or a discussion or a workshop on being a scholar activist and people say, well, you know, they want to privilege the points that make their point and kind of like mask all the issues. And I say, no, 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 no. Because what you do is that you do this, the, 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 the process and in, in injustice, you, you don't give us the evidence, the, the, the data that we need to actually dismantle the problem. So we have to be even more robust. We have to be even more truthful. And it sometimes it hurts. We have to recognize our failings. So even today, creating knowledge by sharing the, you know, the wonderful testimony that we had of Dania. I mean, we, we, now that's out there and, and, and that can't be erased. It's, you know, that's part of one of the gifts that we do with, with knowledge. And that's how activism works inside the academy. If we are privileged enough to actually say, how do we embed that, for example? So can we get access to a budget and then set up a workshop inside a certain space? And I, I'm a big fan of actually using institutional resources outside the institution's walls. That's where the magic happens. People feel safer. The dialogue is richer. It's more honest. And that's where you kind of get the ideas for real change emerging. And then bringing that back in and trying to tease out more resources is recognizing that our job as the person in the institution is to act as that conduit, as that gateway. We speak the language, the speaky spoky language, as my friends call it, you know, and, and but we also have the heart. We, we are embedded in our communities. So just, just, just do our job, just do that translation. And, you know, if, if you have access to funds or someone who has funds, make those connections. Because when it comes down to it, it's about the relationships we make and how we value them and how we actually empower them. So how we, you know, not exploit them, but we empower them to actually make change which is beneficial to not just us and just the world, but you know, to the environment and everybody that we engage with.
I agree with everything Toyin said. <laughs> um, I know in the Indigenous world, we encourage our researchers to actually write about their positionality. And that's often because that's, there's a very powerful story in that, um, that we, um, our students often struggle to give voice to, but lies at the root often of the questions they've asked in their research. So we do have them um, do quite a bit of work around their positionality, where they're, where they're at to. And I think Eve Tuck, and others write about, um, you know, having a sort of theory of change that doesn't matter what the discipline is, that in the sort of field of Indigenous studies, it's not just describing the problems of colonisation, that on its own that's insufficient for changing the lives of our communities. So you can write about the history of colonization and that and there've been some very powerful um powerful research in that space but that can leave our communities feeling even worse even more depressed about our depressing and traumatizing histories if there's no commitment to doing something addressing it healing you know creating change so that sort of theory of change is an expectation uh, that we have of students in Indigenous studies in particular. Thanks, Toyn Linda. I think Denari is going to respond as well. Jordi and Denari? Oh, you're muted, Jordi. Yes, Danelli? Estás ahí? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? I think so. Danelli tienes el micrófono apagado. Ah, there we go. Escucha? Perfectamente. Okay. Mm. Bueno, pues... Me gustaría hacer una pregunta. Además de nuestro apoyo, ¿tú crees que nuestra investigación podría ayudar? Podría ayudar a producir conocimientos que fuese útil en nuestra lucha y de qué manera. Gracias. So your question, uh, Daniel is asking whether your question was how could academic work basically produce uh, something that is productive for very specific struggles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Entonces, Daniel, lo, lo, que, lo, que, lo que preguntaron ellos es de qué manera específica los académicos con su trabajo académico e investigación nos podrían ayudar a nosotros y a, por ejemplo, a ti con tu campaña y a tus compañeras. So both in the struggles and maybe as we were discussing uh, researching the institutions that mm -hmm. produce the lack of rights. So it could be both sides. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is not, it's not easy to answer this one because uh, it, it's not like we encounter every day very practical academic uh, research work that we can use in a practical way. Um, However, it, is, it does exist, right? And, and, and we've done a number of projects, specifically with your contracts where we've brought in researchers who basically will help us uh, um, interview members so when we can put reports together and use them for campaigning, et cetera. But um, yeah, this is something that we were discussing with Aneri uh, before, before this panel. And we were saying, you know, um, in the end, having a placement of UCL researchers within the union, uh, kind of working with members would certainly allow them to have radical, very radical projects within the institution itself, right? It's not like you have to go very far in order to uh, just do something that is participatory and radical. 
uh, you could just step out of, of your classroom and then just talk to the cleaners or the security officers and, and then kind of share the realities and, and look into them. Uh, so yeah, there's a radical opportunity like on your uh, doorstep. Um, and, and I think that's, yeah, that's the, the situation with zero work shows right now, right? That uh, there's certainly a lot of work to do and a lot of potential uh, um, in, in the proper, on um, the research that can be done at, at UCL. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're very happy to coordinate with any of you if you wanna, yeah, do partisan research with us. Well, I've been having a WhatsApp chat uh, with some other ARC committee members uh, and we'll be speaking to Jordi and Daenerys soon, hopefully. Um, so I wanna thank uh, the paper team for putting together this incredible panel of speakers uh, and also the amazing questions that we've had uh, from everyone uh, participating. There's loads of questions uh, still unanswered. I'm really sorry about that. Of course, just a lack of time. Um, but yeah, just again, my huge thanks to Linda, Toya and Daenerys and Jordi. And I'm gonna pass over to uh, Chloe and Victoria for some final comments now. Hi, thanks Raf, thanks everyone. Um, just some quick sort of post event information um, from Victoria and I. Also to echo the issues brought up by all of our speakers, I'll say that as much as the sharing of knowledge, ideas and experiences is essential for us to move forward past the violent colonial legacy of anthropology, so is the redistribution of capital. Uh, so I'm urging, and at this point I'm sort of begging the middle class attendees, uh, middle class academics who have not had their finances affected by the pandemic or by the brutal austerity cuts, um, I'm just speaking to a UK context here, uh, to please share your money, please redistribute your wealth. Uh, these events are free um, and we put a lot of work in it and there's lots of uh, knowledge to be gained that you're all getting. So we're asking people to donate to Free Black University, which is a project that exists to redistribute knowledge and act as a space of incubation for the creation of transformative knowledge in the black community. Also to please reiterate again, uh, we really need you to support the IWGB campaign that Daenerys and Jordi have shared with us tonight um, and also to support the Village HQCIC, which is a Black-led community centre in South London, in Lambeth, which is currently under attack by the council. It should not be up to marginalised folk to keep circulating the same five pounds round to another one another's GoFundMe pages. So the middle class people who are still in this room, who have not been affected the pandem by the pandemic, you have an obligation to redistribute your wealth. All the links are on our website as well, which will be on the chat. So we've made it really, really easy for you to, to get donating. Uh, now that I've got that shaming out of the way, I can thank you all for attending. Um, and also to talk about our second seminar, which is coming up. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your engagement. This has been an absolutely amazing discussion, um, an incredible way to open the paper project series. We look forward to welcoming you to our next seminar, which is in two weeks. So this will be on Tuesday, the 23rd of February from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. GMT. And we will be joined by Dr. Laura Agustin and Hashara Balasubramanian to discuss the politics of witnessing and participating as ethnographers. Laura Agustin is author of Sex at the Margins, Migration, Labor Markets and the Rescue Industry, as well as many media essays, academic articles, a novel titled The Three-Headed Dog and her website, The Naked Anthropologist. You can find her on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Harsha Balasubramanian is my colleague, I'm very honored to say, and is a PhD candidate in UCL's Department of Anthropology. So she's homegrown. She's researching the role of creativity in social change. So her PhD project studies the experiences of practitioners adopting virtual reality in the creative industries, asking how they form and reform ideas about what and who VR is for. A defining feature of Hoshada's work so far has been exploring how non-normative epistemologies and practices may help to critically rethink anthropological field work methods. And these uh, bios are also on our website as well. And I'll shut up now and hand to Victoria. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so these speakers were, so in the next seminar, uh, we're gonna be looking at questions like, how can we move beyond the colonial paradigm of studying the so-called suffering other? Um, 
And we'll be looking at this by interrogating what does it mean to witness and is witnessing enough? Um, so in bringing these two speakers together, Harshada and Laura, uh, we hope to interrogate one of the primary ways in which we produce anthropological knowledge. Um, it'll be a bit different from this one in that there will be some time after each uh, speaker to have questions specific for that speaker, but at the end, there'll also be a, a larger Q&A. Um, so tickets are available through the Eventbrite and on our website, which the link will be put in the chat again. Um, we really hope to see you there. And again, thank you so much to all of our panelists, to, to RAF for chairing, uh, and to my colleagues, the other, the other members of the paper team. Um, and thank you all for attending. I hope you have a good night and see you in two weeks.